yesterday before we left, uh, I gave you a homework assignment, and the homework assignment was to think through uh, what we talked about yesterday. So hopefully some people are going, ah, like, oh no, he's going to ask us. Uh, so let's talk some about what you remember as being the um, more important things that we talked about um, yesterday, what you remember from the day. Okay, so if you think about the sequence of therapy strategies that are used and the kind of sequence that you go through in treatment, what do you start with? Good, psychoeducation, great. And remember that the beginning of the depression treatment is very similar to the beginning of the treatment for anxiety disorders, for conduct disorder, for um, just about everything in CBT. It always starts out with its psychoeducation. Okay? Then after psychoeducation, we moved into coping skills. Okay? So that's really common too. Typically, you start with psychoeducation, then you move into coping, and or the next thing was problem, problem solving. Okay? So it's always starting with psychoeducation, but what comes next varies a little bit. So some of the um, treatment manuals will go into problem solving next, and then some go into coping skills next. And we go into coping skills after psychoeducation because um, the depressed kid's mood gets in the way of them doing anything else. So we want to get their mood up, and then that opens them up to being able to do the problem solving. Okay? And remember we talked about um, combining the two. If you try a problem solving intervention and the kid's having difficulty with it, it's often because they're overwhelmed by the emotions, so go do coping, and then come back to problem solving. Okay? Um, let's see. We talked about case conceptualization. And what are the two parts to the case conceptualization? First part, right. First part's the problem list. And then the second part is? Pardon me? The thoughts. The thoughts, that's it. So linking the thoughts back to the problems. Okay, and um, when we were talking about case conceptualization, we t mentioned that the kids, um, one of the theoretical assumptions is that the kids actively seek to make meaning of um, what's happening in their lives. And so if you use that to um, understand what their experience of the different major life events might be. So like when we were talking about Karen, you know, we were thinking about um, the fact that um, her father had a, a disabilities and was unable to really be part of her life. That her mom had problems with substances. She wasn't part of her life. So what did that mean to Karen? And her aunt and her grandma argue all the time. So how did she interpret that? And how did she interpret all those losses? And how would that interpretation then make her feel? So when we were doing the role play, I was doing a lot of empathizing with her, but that all stemmed from me thinking, okay, so how would she interpret this, these situations? How would it make sense to her? And then that would help me to be more empathic in the role play and to predict what she's thinking. Okay, let's see. And in the conceptualization, we talked about how there's the cognitive piece that everyone always thinks about, but then also we have to remember there's the behavioral component. And so um, from in the behavioral realm, what um, skills deficits do the kids typically have that are depressed? Coping skills deficits and Deficits in problem solving, okay? So we can pretty much count on those two deficits. 
And um, so we have the cognitive area, the behavioral area, and then we talked about how there's typically the, are oftentimes the biological basis to it. And um, there's the emotional disturbance, which could be the dysphoria, irritability, or, or um, anhedonia. And then that that's all, um, that all interacts, so the cognitive area interacts with the behavioral area and vice versa, and along with the biology and with the emotions, and so it's all interacting in a reciprocal fashion. And then it's embedded within the child's um, current environment, and um, that current environment creates the learning experiences that lead to the development of the behavioral skills and leads to the development of the core beliefs and maintains the core beliefs. And then that's also embedded within the child's learning history. Okay? So that we take all of that into consideration when we're conceptualizing the case and then we develop the treatment plan based on our conceptualization. And that, um, that drives the um, depression treatment. Okay. So, um, we talked about coping skills, and there are five broad categories of coping skills. They were? Soothing. Soothing and relaxing. Fun and, fun and distracting. Exercise. Exercise. Talking to someone. Talking to someone and? Change your thoughts. Good. Okay. And um, we also wanted the kids to get to recognize change in emotions because um, the cognitive behavioral interventions are, um, they kind of grew out of the behavioral um, area of psychology and in particular out of um, the self-control models. And so the self-control models um, are based on the idea that, uh, for intervention, are based on the idea that you have the person um, tune into what they're feeling, how they're behaving, and what they're thinking. So you have them self-monitor. And then when something's not quite right, that's supposed to be a cue to use the skills that you teach them. Okay, so that's kind of a, a theoretical underpinning of all the CBT interventions, is this kind of self-control model. So um, the depression treatment is similar to that in that we want the kids to recognize when they have a problem, when they're experiencing stress, when their mood changes, um, when they're having an interpersonal conflict, for example, and then to use that as a cue to use their skills. So if you, um, to get them to recognize those things, we were using um, psychoeducation and we were using the three Bs. Tuning into what's happening in your body, in your brain, and through your behavior. That helps you to recognize a change in mood. And um, so that's helpful because sometimes they're going to feel irritable, sometimes down. Sometimes their mood's going to be elevated, and we want them to catch those different um, experiences so that if they experience the positive things, we can have them, positive emotions, we can um, have them tell us more about that so that we can recreate those experiences so their mood stays up. If we find that there are things that happen that the mood goes down, and there are things that we can change, then we teach them problem solving. And if there are things that cause their mood to go down and we can't change those things, then we have them cope. Okay? So that's why it's so critical for them to tune into their emotions so that we can get them to then use the skills that we're teaching them. Okay, so um, if you think about where we've kind of gone over the first day, um, and if we were doing treatment, we would have educated the child about um, depression. We would have taught 
the child to tune into um, his or her thinking, mood, and behavior. And um, we would have taught the child then how to cope with irritability or sadness and how to solve problems that arise in their life that lead to the irritability and sadness or distress in general. Okay? So um, that happens in the first nine sessions. And our hope is, as a result of all that, their mood's going to come up. And um, it now opens up their thinking. So yesterday, Paulo and I were talking about the intervention program. And he said, well, um, what would happen if you put the cognitive restructuring first? Because we were talking about a study in the component analysis kind of, of the intervention. And so if you put the thinking first, the cognitive restructuring first, um, I think it creates a problem. So here's the way I'll pose it to you. Let's say that you were um, a depressed 12-year-old, 12-year-old. And um, I taught you to tune into your thinking. And so if you think about someone who's depressed and maybe a little bit anxious, and you tune into your thinking, what's going to happen? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to get worse because you're so focused on the things that bring you down that you're going to get more down. It's going to cause your mood to drop. So um, that's why we saved um, the cognitive restructuring for the second half of treatment, because we're hoping that we've gotten the kids' moods up and we've given them skills so that when they focus on the things that they're thinking um, and their mood starts to go down as a result, then um, they can use their coping skills to bring it back up. Okay. Um, so also, yesterday we talked about um, Lynn Ream's model of depression. It's a self-control model of depression. And um, remember we had the Catch the Positive diary, that list of things that they self-monitor. And um, Lynn's research showed that if you self-monitor negative things, unpleasant things, your mood goes down. And if you self-monitor positive things, your mood goes up, and you're more likely to do the things that lead to the positive mood. So knowing Lynn's research and how that self-monitoring impacted mood, that also led us to think we need to um, save the cognitive restructuring for later in treatment. OK? All right, so today, this morning, we're going to um, work on the cognitive restructuring part of the treatment. And um, I think we'll do a lot of role plays of it because it's not something that comes real easily. It takes some practice doing it to, um, to kind of get it. Okay, so um, we stay with this idea that children are, um, really don't know how to be good patients. And so we want to educate them and help them to become good patients. And um, so we want them to start to tune in to what they're thinking and to um, understand that the way they think affects the way that they feel. Okay? So we, we're going to do some activities that lead them to um, recognize that. OK, so some of the things that we want the kids to understand, um, one of the things is that we build our perceptions. So um, if you think about, well, you can even think about yourself, but if you also think about a, someone that's 12 years old or you know, 9 to 14, um, when they have a thought, what do they believe about that thought? Do they believe that it's um, something that's constructed and possibly false? Or do they think because they think it, it's true? They think that because they think it, it's true. Exactly. And um, 
you know, for kids, it's really a um, kind of a mind-boggling thing when you tell them and you talk about and you help them understand that just because you think it, it doesn't mean that it's true. It just is a foreign concept because who's ever said that to them? You know, nobody really talks about that directly. So it takes them a while to understand that that's the case. And we, that if they believe that their thoughts, thoughts are always true, then when you go to do cognitive restructuring, it's going to be an argument. That's not going to work. So instead, you have to help them understand that they build their perceptions. Sometimes they're accurate and sometimes they're not. And the even more surprising thing for the kids is you can choose which thought you want to believe. We do that every day with every thought. We choose to believe certain ones and not believe others. And it's an act of choice. But for the kids, that's really a foreign concept. They think there's only one way to think, and that's the way they're thinking, and that's got to be accurate. But it's not. So um, we start by helping them understand that they build their perceptions, and the way that they build them determines what the thought means. And the meaning of the thought determines how they feel. And um, since we build our thoughts, we can make mistakes in the way that we build them. And um, I don't know how true this next statement is, but um, we, we still maybe err a little on the si side of um, pushing it towards most of the negative thoughts aren't true. You know, for some kids, the negative thoughts are really going to be true. Their lives are very unfortunate. Karen's life is very unfortunate. She thinks that um, her aunt doesn't really um, care much about her. May be true. It sounds like the aunt really kind of resents her. So um, you want to um, push the idea that negative thoughts aren't true. But if a negative thought is true, what do you do? Coping yeah, we teach coping skills. So if her aunt really is not a very loving person or doesn't really love her, then we're going to teach her how to cope with that. And we're going to teach her problem solving so that she can hopefully change the situation. And we're going to do some parent training and maybe family intervention to um, change it. Um, we don't have to believe our thoughts. So there's this new movement in um, psychotherapy, and what's the new movement? Mindfulness. mindfulness. Okay, and so what do you do in mindfulness with their negative thoughts? You just let them pass. They're just thoughts. They come, they go. They don't have any special meaning. You just let them pass through. So um, we don't just let them pass through, although that would be great if the kids could learn to do that. Um, but from the um, cognitive therapy perspective, from Beck's perspective, although he definitely um, welcomes the mindfulness movement and sees the value in letting thoughts go through, but when they don't just go through, he would um, say that the cognitive restructuring techniques are useful. And that's where you evaluate the validity of those thoughts. And then you um, help yourself to see that they're invalid and that a new, more adaptive thought's um, realistic and the one to believe. So we can, um, we don't have to believe our thoughts. We can choose to change our thoughts. Um, we can choose to not listen to our thoughts and we can ask ourselves, some key questions to help us evaluate and change our thoughts. OK, so those are the things, um, those are the kind of the concepts that we want the kids to really get. OK, so eight, nine-year-old kid, it's pretty um, high-level thinking. 
So we have to make it concrete for them. And um, yesterday when we were doing the role play with Karen, when she would um, bring up a negative, when a negative thought was evident, I would always try to tie it to what she felt and how she behaved. So I was constantly trying to make the link between the two. So that helps to kind of subtly build um, in for the child the understanding that their thinking is related to um, what they feel and how they behave. And then um, we're also going to start to introduce alternative interpretations along the way. So could it be that um, the reason your aunt and your grandmother don't allow you to wear the shoes that your mom gave you is because they think that um, they're a little too adult-like, that maybe they're just not appropriate for your school. It's not that they don't like your mom or that they don't care about how you look. It's really that they just think that it's something that maybe isn't good for you. And if they thought that it was something that wasn't good for you or wouldn't um, create a nice impression, does that mean that they like you? They care about you? Or does it mean that they're just being mean? So um, you start to introduce these other ways of thinking about it. And then um, that helps the kids over time to start to think, huh, maybe my thoughts aren't always true. You know, so you're just doing it kind of um, gently and um, kind of strategically throughout treatment as you're leading up to the time when you actually teach them how to restructure their thoughts. Okay, um, so uh, we talked yesterday about the bag of thoughts and so you put, you know, thoughts on in these little clouds and then in the hearts you put emotions, the kids draw either a cloud or a heart out and then they, they draw the heart, they say what their, the feeling is and what they might have been thinking if they felt that way. And if they had a particular thought, then what would they be feeling? Okay? So, um, yeah, maybe we'll do that later on. Okay, so take a minute or two and um, look at this cartoon and come up with, develop a story for what you think is happening in the cartoon. Okay, everybody have a story? Okay, all right. So, um, what, what's your story about what's happening? Um, the girl and the blonde kid got into an argument and the kid with the brown hair is trying to uh, Okay. All right. How about your story? Um, I thought that they were prank calling her. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they're crank calling her. All right. That's pretty good. That's funny. Your story? I actually have the same thing. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, huh. Tell what you two did when you were 10 years old and <laughs> home alone. Okay. How about your story? What did you think? Okay. Okay, so we got crank calls. We've got she's upset. And um, your story was kind of like that, but a little different. Yeah, uh, the, 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 I guess the, the kid was, oh, yeah. was trying to help. Oh, I was trying to help. Trying to help the other two get to the topic. Okay. All right. So let's try one other one. Um, how about yours? Um, I, I thought she was gossiping. Ah. Gossiping, and he heard out about the, the blonde uh -huh. um, boy and was upset. And the other one was sort of an intermediary. Okay. All right. So, um, you, everybody saw the same cartoon. Oh. 
No, I thought she called up to give them some funny news. Ah. They, um, her idea was relating to Blondie, and they were laughing. Okay. Because she, sm either she has a little smirk on her face. Uh huh. You know, with a funny anecdote that happened, or, and those two were laughing. And yeah. Okay, so everybody was looking at the exact same cartoon, but you each had a different thought about what was going on in the cartoon. So what does that tell us about the way that we think? Was her story right? Or was it really that they were crank calling? Or could it have been that you know, it was much more positive, kind of helpful kind of thing. So can you see the um, story about um, that's more positive? Or could you see that maybe it was the crank call? I could see the crank call, but I don't, I don't think she looks pretty, really happy. <laughs> OK. So you could change your thinking a little bit to see the crank call. So um, what have we learned about our thinking? That we make our own reality. Yeah, that we construct our own way of seeing things. And um, as people were saying their stories, could you switch in your thinking and see their kind of story? Uh-huh. So we can change the way we think. Was one story right and the others wrong? Mm -mm. So which story or which way of thinking do you want to choose? Yeah. That, that'd be great to choose the story or the thinking that helps you to feel better. Okay? So the girls in the groups, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, they got it. It was amazing to watch well, I didn't watch because I would hear the audio tapes, to listen to how well they got this concept and how um, it was a nice, concrete way to help them see that you construct the way, the meaning, the interpretation of what's going on, that um, there are multiple ways of looking at it, and that you can choose which one you want to believe. So um, that worked really well. OK, here's another um, strategy that we used. And um, you can choose to do this or not. It's really up to you. But um, have you heard of the, or read about in any of the kind of kids therapy books about the rock candy activity? OK, yeah. She has back there. So she's going to know what we're going to do. Um, everybody, well, most people are wearing sandals, so the beads might slip out. But um, so what you want to do is um, let's see, since we're kind of split down the middle, I'll have you pass them around. So if you could just take one and pass it. And then we'll pass them this way. Uh-huh. OK. Okay, so take your favorite flavor of Jolly Rancher if you have one. <laughs> so this activity came out of um, some school counselor book on like a 101 counseling activities kind of thing. But then we um, changed it around to fit with the 
um, kind of cognitive model that we are trying to teach the kids. Okay. All right, so now what you um, want to do, or what would be helpful for the exercise, is if you take the bead and put it into your um, shoe or sandal, okay? Karen was kind of like immediately grimacing <laughs> as she gets the idea, okay? And then um, go ahead and stand up. All right, so what do you notice? It's pretty unpleasant, right? Okay, so go ahead and um, take the Jolly Rancher and put that in your other shoe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and um, start eating the Jolly Rancher. Okay, so um, what flavor did you choose? Blue raspberry. Blue raspberry. Good. How does it taste? Yeah? Can you, you can really notice the sweetness in it. And um, does it taste kind of like blue raspberry popsicles and all that? Yeah. Okay, good. So concentrate on the flavor. Um, what flavor did you get? Watermelon. Watermelon. Oh, I like watermelon. Yeah, good. So um, does it taste like real watermelon, a little bit tart? Or? Yeah, okay. Good. Um, how about yours? What flavor is yours? Apple. Apple, sour apple. Mm, so good. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Good. So everybody really concentrate on that flavor. Got it? Okay. So when you're concentrating on the flavor, where does your mind go? To the flavor. What happens to the bead? the bead goes away. So if you really concentrate on the sweet things, the good things, even though you're having something bad happen, what happens to the bad thing that's happening? It goes away. So you can choose to either pay attention to the bead, or you can choose to pay attention to the good kind of sweet things that are going on in your life. So if you choose to pay attention to the good and the sweet things that are going on, how do you feel? Okay, and if you choose to focus on the bead, the bad things that are going on, how do you feel? Irritable, kind of frustrated, not so good. Okay? So um, that's it. You know, we've just tried in a concrete way to help the kids see that there you can think multiple things at once, good things, bad things, and then that you can, uh, depending upon which you focus on, that determines how you feel, and um, that you have a choice for which one you focus on. And the kids got it real quickly, they got it easily, um, and it was kind of a fun activity for them. So we tried to come up with concrete ways to help the kids understand that they construct their emotions and that they can choose which one that they want to believe. And so that starts to lay the groundwork for the cognitive restructuring that you're going to do um, later on. And in your handouts, it's um, scripted more and gives you a better sense of how you do it. Okay, so um, we want to start to get into the negative thoughts that the kids have um, because they're necessary for cognitive restructuring. But um, kids have a hard time recognizing their own thoughts. So if you're in a group setting, it makes it easier because it's easier to notice somebody else's negative thoughts than it is to notice your own. So um, what we would do is um, we, we started a game around the sixth session, and it continued for the rest of therapy. And um, the game was catch the negative thought. 
So whenever another group member would verbalize a negative thought, someone in the group would um, yell out, negative thought, and whoever caught it first got a bead. Okay? And the reason the beads were important was um, in the first meeting, we did this um, group building activity that um, it's called the web activity. Has it, and I mentioned it briefly yesterday. I'm not sure if anyone has um, seen it before. But what you end up doing, here we'll do it. Um, you, I'll throw it to one of you. OK, good catch. So um, what you would do is you would um, wrap the end of the yarn around, if you can find it. Would that work? OK. And um, so you loosely tie it around your wrist. Oh, so they can get it on camera? OK. Yes, probably like four people. Okay, so then you would pass it to another person, anyone you want, and she would um, end up um, wrapping one end around your wrist and then um, pass it to somebody else. That's okay. Okay, so um, what happens when um, Tuma moves her hand? Kind of, what does it do to the rest of you? Yeah. Pulls on it, okay? So um, you know, when we're in the group, whatever each person does has an effect on each other person. So if um, Tumas says something that's really um, kind of important to her and someone else reacts with kind of like, oh, I don't care, that's nothing, then that is going to affect the way Tuma feels. Okay? So each of us in how we um, act affects each other person. So let's keep passing it on around. So as we get to know each other in the group, we end up um, getting kind of closer to each other. And um, the bonds that we have um, keep growing and getting stronger. Okay, So we're having a little um, yarn <laughs> issue here. And um, there we go. So they solved that problem. Not so much. And if we had a scissors, we could solve it. Oh, there we go. So the more that we um, meet, the more often we meet, the more that we talk about, <laughs> the um, stronger that, um, the more bonds we have with each other and the stronger that it gets. And so we end up having the kids keep going with the yarn back and forth, back and forth, as um, they act like they're continuing to meet and then um, what the therapist ends up doing is taking one of the folders with the, um, the uh, workbook in it and puts it in the middle of the yarn, and the yarn ends up supporting it. And so we talk about how that's like a metaphor for how um, the relationship that develops and all the bonds that we have can support really heavy things. And so it can support the heavy things that we talk about and how um, that's what's going to happen when we're in group and as we get to know each other. It's going to be supportive, and it's going to help, help us to handle the heavier things in life. Okay, So 
how this relates to the beads is um, the girls had wrapped initially um, around their wrists and so the, they get a scissors and they cut it and they keep the yarn that's on their wrist and for um, doing things in group they earn beads and they end up creating these different um, bracelets and things like that out of all the beads that they um, collect and when we do the um, web activity um, whenever there's like a uh, threat to the group cohesion we'll bring it back out and do it again and so they end up collecting more and more yarn and they want more and more beads and so it becomes a motivating thing to get the beads okay all right thanks for doing it um, so the <laughs> See, it's such a strong bond that they <laughs> follow each other around and they're so connected. Um, so the kids want to earn the beads and, and they um, want to be the first then to catch the negative thought. So um, the rule is if you catch someone else's negative thought, you get one bead. If you catch your own negative thought, it's two beads. So it gets them to really tune into the negative thought idea. And it's just fun and, um, for the kids, so, so it works out OK. Um, the therapist is going to elicit negative thoughts by asking the kids, you know, what, are, what were you thinking? What are you thinking? OK? And um, you're also going to get at beliefs. And that, remember, is what um, is the goal of therapy, is changing the core beliefs. So the three beliefs that are associated with depression are, I am unlovable, unlovable worthless, worthless helpless. helpless. OK. So we want to um, help the kids get away from those three beliefs and to build the belief, I'm lovable, I have value, and I'm efficacious. OK? And um, so you see the beliefs in the themes that, have, um, that keep coming up in the thoughts that the kids verbalize. Okay? And you're going to see the beliefs in the consistency of thoughts over time, consistency in behavior. Okay, so for example, um, if we stay with Karen, the Karen character, um, Karen goes to school, and she doesn't um, interact with any kids. She doesn't try to make new friendships. Okay? She um, avoids her aunt. She, um, let's see. Well, if you start with those two behaviors, what hypothesis might you have about which core belief underlies her behavior? I'm unlovable. I'm unlovable. Okay? And we know from her history that of, re of neglect and some rejection that that makes sense. Okay? So if she's a person who keeps people at distance, keeps avoiding um, people, keeps avoiding relationships, that's behavior that may signal there's an un I'm unlovable belief underlying that behavior. See, so watch for consistency. Um, thoughts that are especially emotionally laden that really bring up a lot of emotion, they're ones that may reflect a belief. So yesterday you said in the role play you got choked up when I said... Um, people leave you all the time. Okay. So that would be a cue then that there's a vulnerability and possibly a belief that's underlying this people leave me all the time. I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, but there's something that's probably there because that's more emotionally laden. Um, thoughts that appear over and over and over, they're likely to reflect a belief. And um, sometimes you deduce a belief by looking at um, what thought could explain all these others, and what thought could explain all these behaviors, okay? like we do in the case conceptualization. 
we see the problem and we think, what's the thought that could underlie it? Okay? So, um, okay. All right, so let's go ahead and um, try it. And um, so what we're going to do is um, Karen's going to come back for day meeting number two. And um, in this meeting, I'll try to elicit um, some of the negative thoughts and um, bring out, hopefully, some beliefs. Okay? And your job in the um, role play is um, to yell out negative belief, negative thought, negative thought. Okay. All right. So whenever you notice that um, I've elicited a thought, um, your job is to catch it. Okay. And when you think that we have um, hit on something that reflects a belief, if you'd go ahead and um, say, just say, hey, I think you hit a belief. It's this. Okay? So I think we have to move more towards the center. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, if you also think through yesterday, we talked about the structure of the um, meetings. So, um, let's see. Did I give you homework? I can't remember. Did I give her homework? I don't think so. I don't think so? Okay, so then um, normally what I would have done at the end of the first meeting, my common homework is I'd like you to think about um, what goals you have for our meetings. What is it that you really want to get out of our meetings? I give her homework. You have her to identify some people in the school that she might Oh, have. that's right. Good. I did. Uh, okay. So thanks for remembering. Um, okay. So we're going to try to follow the structure to the typical session. And um, also, normally, you'd have like a dry erase board with your um, agenda items on it, and then you'd work off of that too. Okay. So, um, hey Karen, how are you? Fine. Yeah? Um, normally when we meet, at the very beginning, what I'm going to ask you to do is, um, did I just make you a little uncomfortable? No. No? Okay. So you looked like you uh, might be, I might have made you a little uncomfortable because you kind of scrunched up and I'm pulled away. I'm mad. Yeah? Okay. So normally when we meet, I'm going to start by asking you how you're feeling. And it sounds like you're feeling angry today. Yeah? So on a 0 to 10 scale from 0 not angry at all to 10 just furious and ready to blow up, 5 being... Nah, I'm pretty angry, but I'm still kind of in control. Where are you? Ten. Wow. Um, and where you, you look like you're pretty upset. Um, and do you feel like you really just want to explode and get rid of it, or what's going on? I'm just I'm mad at my aunt. Mm. Okay. So... Um, what I would do in this situation is I'm, I'm left with a kind of a two options. And um, so if I'm in my own office, what I would probably end up doing would be a coping skills activity. So I'd probably say something to her like, I can see that you're really angry. You say you're at a 10. Let's bring that down. And um, uh, let's, and then I'd offer up some games that we might play, or um, depending upon my sense of what um, Karen's like and what she likes, I might say, you know, let's shoot, um, let's go and shoot baskets, or um, let's do something that's physical, or maybe I'd say, well, let's just go for a walk and cool off. 
Okay, so um, that's probably what I would end up doing, um, just to bring down that affect since it's so high. And I'd get a mood rating first, then we'd go and do the activity, then I'd get a mood rating again, and we'd discuss how it worked. Okay, that's I, that's where I'm leaning towards going. But um, since we don't have, we're not in my office and we can't do that, we either could imagine that we did or I'll just try some other um, things and see how that goes, okay? All right, so um, you said you're just really furious with your aunt right now and um, you're feeling about a 10, but you seem to be doing a pretty good job at keeping it in check right here and I'm really proud of you for that. Um, if, you've, if when we're talking, if you feel like it's just unbearable, your anger is getting so bad you just want to hit something or break something, tell me and we'll stop talking, okay? And we'll get up and we'll go and um, we'll get a drink or we'll just go and walk around or we'll do something that helps you to bring, it, bring that anger down. Okay. okay? Thanks. And I really want to thank you for telling me what's upsetting you because I know from our first meeting, that it's hard for you to trust people. And um, oftentimes you think that, you know, like if you tell people things, they're going to use it against you. When I tell my aunt that I'm mad, she says I don't have any reason to be mad. Oh. Uh, so um, she, her, her understanding of your emotions is that they're not kind of valid, that you just can't have those things, that it's, there's no reason for it, so how could you feel it? But obviously, you feel it. So, um, what happened? I, my mom called because I got my cell phone back. Uh -huh. And then my aunt said, who's that on the phone? And I said, it's my mom. And she grabbed the phone and started yelling at her and saying that she was never going to see me again and that I was never going to be able to see her because she was going to keep her away from me. Wow. That must have been incredibly hurtful for her to say that because it's your mom. And you said last time that we met that your mom's still an important person to you even though she's not always been there for you. Mm -hmm. And when she said to you, when she took the phone away and she was yelling at your mom and said, you're never going to see Karen again and to you, you're never going to see your mom again, what were you thinking? She can't do that. Oh, kind of like that's not fair. She has no right to do that. She has no right to do that. Okay. And um, so you all were supposed to say? There we go. And um, when you, I get it. So when you think to yourself, somebody doesn't have a right to do something and they're doing something to hurt you and they have no right to do it, then you get angry. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So um, if I'm in your shoes, though, I'd also be, have some other thoughts for what, in that situation. Were there other things that you were thinking? My aunt is stupid. Mm. <laughs> um. And that actually, sorry to interrupt you, but that's been um, the second or the third time she said my aunt is stupid. So I don't know if it's just a 12-year-old thing that, you know, everybody's stupid, and so it might just be that. Or I'm still making mental note that this is a recurrent theme. And so maybe it's the way that she diminishes the value of people. She says they're stupid. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's something that she's heard a lot. You're stupid. You're an idiot. And so she uses it against people. But anyway, it's just come up a number of times, so I'm going to make note of that. And it's going to become something that's going to be important. Or maybe not. Maybe I find out it's meaningless. So you're thinking she was stupid? <laughs> I was thinking she was, my aunt is stupid. She doesn't have a right to keep me away from my mom. She's going to scare my mom away. Mm. My mom is never going to want me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, I don't know. You had a lot of thoughts. It's no wonder why you got so upset. And it's not like my aunt wants me anyway. Uh-huh. So that's <laughs> negative thought. Okay. So um, on top of it, 
you feel like your aunt is really putting you in a horrible spot, that she possibly could be scaring off your mom, and your mom wants you, and you kind of want to be with your mom. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, your aunt, you're thinking your aunt doesn't really want you, and that leads you to the conclusion that I have nobody. If my mom's scared away by my aunt, I don't my aunt anything. doesn't. Oh. Uh huh. So you help yourself to feel a little bit better when you think that nobody's going to be there for you by saying, hey, I don't really need anybody. I can take care of myself. Yeah. Huh. I think we just learned something. If you think to yourself, my aunt's going to take my mom away. She's going to push her out of the picture. My aunt doesn't want me. Nobody wants me. I'm going to be all by myself. You feel lonely. Yeah, lonely. I'd feel a little bit scared if I was 12 and in that situation. Do you get a little bit of, feel a little bit scared? I can take care of myself. Uh-huh. So when you get to that point, you quickly switch your thinking and you switch it to, I can take care of myself. And what does that do to that feeling of loneliness? I don't feel lonely. Uh-huh. So it eliminates that feeling of loneliness. So if you change the way that you think about it, it actually changes the way that you feel. Hmm. And I think that that's going to be something that's going to be really important for us to recognize over time, that the way that you think affects the way you feel. And sometimes um, we know that we all make mistakes in the way that we think. And um, sometimes those mistakes make us feel really bad. But if we correct those mistakes, then we end up feeling better. And you kind of do that for yourself some. You change your thinking, and it changes the way you feel. I thought that I would just be able to call my mom back, and she would answer the phone. But when I called back, she didn't pick up. Wow. So you ended up getting evidence that confirmed your fear that maybe as a result of your aunt yelling at your mom, your mom gets upset, and then she kind of distances herself. Yeah, maybe she was thinking, this is, you know, Karen isn't worth it. Oh. OK. And what belief did we just hit? Worthlessness. Worthlessness. OK, good. So you thought to yourself, wow, um, maybe mom thinks Karen isn't worth it. Mm -hmm. And um, is that a thought that you commonly have? I don't know. Hmm. I mean, then I went and I said to my aunt, you know, you made it so that my mom won't call me back. And she said, can you blame her? Because no one wants to be around you because you're depressed all the time. Wow. What a hurtful thing to say. So she just made you feel as if you cause other people to not want to be around you. And she said, Grandma thinks the same thing, and why don't you just go away? And I said, fine, I will. Wow. So I walked out of the house. Uh-huh. And um, last time we met, we found that that's your primary way of dealing with unpleasant feelings, is to just avoid them, get out of there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's helpful, because it allows you to calm down. Now, when you walked out of the house, where did you end up going? I went to the corner store. OK. And from the last time we met, it sounds like between your house and the corner store is a short distance, and it's actually a pretty safe place to be. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were at the corner store and you um, walked there while you were there, you said you liked to look around the store and sometimes buy some things, mm -hmm. like candy and things. Did that help to bring down your anger? Or did you stay just as angry? I think I was still pretty angry. I mean, they don't want me. Mm -hmm. So you have, it sounds like you've really come to the conclusion that your aunt and your grandmother don't want you, and that 
they've pushed the only person in your life out of your life, your mom. Mm -hmm. And so you're really feeling pretty abandoned. My cousin likes me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your cousin Alan, Alan. likes you. Oh, and um, there were some other people that you mentioned that you also think really like you that are family members. Mm -hmm. Carla, but she's like three hours away and she's got a baby. Uh-huh. And that's your 16-year-old cousin. Mm -hmm. She really likes you and your uncle's family yeah. that Carla's part of seems to really like you too. Yeah. So there's some um, kind of reassurance that you are able to provide yourself and that you recognize, hey, there are these people who seem to not like me, but then there's also these other people who really do like me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you remember Alan and Carla and your uncle and those people then and you think to yourself hey they like me how does that affect your feelings it makes me hate my aunt more oh. it makes me hate my grandma more why don't they just give me away I see so if they're gonna be so mean to me why wouldn't they let me just go and stay with someone who's really nice to me yeah. Because they, they want me. My grandma doesn't want me. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want me. Mm -hmm. It would be really painful to live with someone that you thought didn't want you and that always, or that commonly said things that led you to that conclusion. So um, has that been something that's been part of your life, that you've had people who've said things and done things that lead you to the conclusion you're unwanted? Yeah, I think so. I was on a soccer team once, and the girls wouldn't let me play, and I'm not good at it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I just quit, and then my aunt kept saying, you have to go back, you have to go back. And I said, why? I'm, I just sit there on the bench. I'm uh -huh. useless. So it sounds to me like your strategy for avoiding the things that un were unpleasant was used again when you were in soccer. Mm -hmm. That it was something you didn't like, so you got out of there. And your aunt wanted you to say, I don't know, how come? Why do you think your aunt might wanted you she have wanted you to stay? She wants me to be a no normal girl. Oh. She wants me to wear lipstick. She wants me to wear dresses. Not only huh? I like rap music. I like, you know, tennis shoes. I like ripped jeans. Uh huh. But she thinks that I should be a girl. I should go to dances at school, and that's not who I am. I see. So your aunt has these this picture of how she would like you to be, and that picture is different from who you see yourself as. She doesn't even know who I am. Oh, I get it. So it's really disappointing that she wants you to be somebody else, and it's disappointing because she doesn't even know who you really are. So you feel like she's not really even connected to you mm -hmm. at all. What would happen if she did know who you are? She would hate me. Oh, huh. Even more than she hates me now. Wow. And why do you, th why do you, what leads you to that conclusion that if people really get to know who you are, they really hate, would hate you? Because I'm not normal. Hmm. So you see yourself as not normal and as someone who's um, despised, hated by others. Mm -hmm. And that you see yourself that way, kind of at the core of who you are. And I think she thinks that she can make me normal if she makes me wear a dress or makes me dress up or wear makeup or lose weight. Huh. But I'm not normal. Huh. You know, I'm a little bit confused because on the one hand, you're really angry at your aunt because she wants you to do all these things that don't fit with who you are. But you just said that the reason she wants you to do those things is because they would help you to be normal, in your words. And 
sounds like you don't like yourself because you see yourself as not normal. So is your aunt really trying to be mean when she's doing that? Or is, does she maybe just get it that, that um, if you saw yourself as more normal as fitting in with the other kids, that maybe your life would be a little bit better? At least from what you've just told me, if you saw yourself as normal. I think she thinks she's doing something good. Mm. So why would she try to do something good if all she does is hate you and want you out of her life? I think that if I could be normal, she would love me. Mm. I see. But you also think you can't do that, and that's not really you. And so she never could really love you. And until you're able to achieve being more like what she pictures, she's not going to be able to love you. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can see that you see yourself as really stuck because you want to be true to yourself. But if you're true to yourself, then your aunt really doesn't love you. And I don't. I would try the things that she wants me to do, but I don't look good in dresses. Uh huh. I'm, you know, I'm ugly, and I don't. Hmm. I don't think that if I get my yeah, nails yeah. done or my hair cut, that it's going. It's not going to do any good. Oh. And she wants to do this, but then I think that it's just not. It's not going to. It's not going to make me pretty. It's not going to make me normal. Uh huh. Wow. So again. It sounds like no matter which way you think of going, you still you feel stuck. You think there's nothing that's going to help. Sounds like you also feel really helpless. Like there's just nothing that's going to change. Nothing is going to change. Uh huh. The, the only thing that's going to change is I'm going to get away from them. I see. And then things will get better. Maybe. I just won't have to deal with them. Ah. Uh, so they may not get better. It's just that that hassle will be gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, I get it. So if you got away from them, you'd still think of yourself as someone that other people hate, and you'd still see yourself as helpless? I would live by myself. I don't think I, don't think I would have a family or have a roommate or anything. Hmm. Wow. That makes me pr feel really sad, because last time when we met, you mentioned that the time that you feel good is when you feel connected to people like Alan and Carla. And so if you moved away and you didn't have family, you didn't have anyone, it seems like it would be pretty lonely and painful for you. Wow. Probably. But I wouldn't have to hear people argue all the time. I wouldn't have to have my mom say, I'm going to come and pick you up for the fair, and then she doesn't come. Uh-huh. So you'd avoid those disappointments of, uh, that other people seem to inflict on you. Yeah. But still, at the core, it wouldn't change the way that you think about yourself. 